El Nino Southern Os. Monitoring the El Nino Southern Oscillation and its impacts on weather. This is a this third example is titled "Using AI to Predict Convective Weather Hazards." Just a couple of ground rules. We will be monitoring the chat, but if you have questions, please use the Zoom Q and A feature. Enter your questions there, and we will attempt to either answer them immediately or. Um, if it's something like, I don't understand what John said, um, we can, I will interrupt John and say, can you please explain this in a little bit more detail, something like that. So we want you to understand. So again, the title today is using AI to predict convective weather hazards. Let's go to the next slide if I can. Let's see, yep, that's the next slide. Your present, your the, I'm Scott Lindstrom. I'm on the right, but the person of importance for this is uh, John Centineo, who's a research meteorologist at the National Severe Storms Lab. It's a NOAA lab that's down in Norman, Oklahoma. Um, although John does work in Wisconsin, which is where I'm I am at, so he's going to be talking about how he has developed tools using AI and machine learning to predict uh, convective weather. This is part of a series that is that is managed by the American Meteorological Society Satellite Meteorology, Oceanography, and Climatology, that SATMOC Working Group on Virtual Training. This is the third one. As you saw, there were 300 people at the first two, and we're hoping for similar attendance today. And the people who are in charge or have people who have been involved in putting this together are shown on this slide. So thank you very much to that. Thank you to them for that. Just a spoiler alert, what, what are you going to do after this class? There's going to be a survey and that this link will show up in the chat occasionally as well. Um, but with that, I think I've said everything I'm supposed to. I did not really introduce John. He's going to introduce himself. Um, so I will stop sharing and take it away, John. Okay, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, hopefully that looks good for everyone. Yeah, well, welcome everyone. Good, good morning, good afternoon, and good night for people all across the world. It's cool to see everyone tune in. And this this presentation is going to be a little bit different than some of the other ones in uh, from, from past weeks and in the, the next week. But it's we will tie it into to ENSO and, and con, how that affects convection in mainly in North America. But I'm hoping you can uh, learn a few things and and uh, to bring back to to uh, your research and and apply artificial intelligence uh, to different problems you have for convection. As Scott said, I'm a research meteorologist at the National Severe Storms Lab, which is part of the United States' National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. So let's go ahead and get started. Oops. Okay, so really brief outline. I'm going to talk about what something called prob severe is. And then we'll talk a little bit more about ENSO and, and convection in, in North America. And I'm gonna go into different products in prob severe. Version three, something called intense storm net and something called lightning cast. And then we'll have a couple notebooks for the latter portion of uh, the presentation. Okay, so what is prob severe? Well, prob severe is, is kind of short for a probability of severe models. It, it started out as a severe weather now casting models, but it's evolved into a collection of machine learning models to now cast or short-term short -term prediction for convective hazards. Props for version three are machine learning models for, for forecasting large hail, wind gusts, and tornadoes. 
this model called intense storm net uses something called deep learning, which I'll explain on the next couple of slides. It uses only satellite data from satellite images to detect the intense parts of storms. And then another model called lightning cast is also a satellite only deep learning model for, for predicting lightning in the, in the short term. Okay, so some of you are surely uh, aware of what AI and ML and deep learning are, but just really briefly, artificial intelligence is basically just any technique which allows machines to try to make human decisions or human products. Machine learning is a popular subset of AI, which uses mathematical models and method, statistical methods to help machines to, to make these uh, uh, human-like decisions or, or behavior. And deep learning is a, a subset of machine learning, which makes uh, use of multi-layer neural, neural networks. And it's also much more heavily um, heavy in computation than a lot of traditional machine learning methods. Okay, so that's at a very high level what, that's what those three items are. But to break it down a little bit more here, some key differences in machine learning versus deep learning. Traditional machine learning has a lot of um, uh, manual extraction or feature extraction, feature development. There's a lot more human involvement. Whereas deep learning, it's it, there's, humans are still involved, but there's much, much less intervention. There's supervised and reinforcement learning are part of the training methods for a lot of traditional ML tools, where it's something called autoencoder, which we'll talk about, and uh, generative adversarial networks, GANs, are some of the more popular training methods uh, in our field for, for deep learning. The um, There's all sorts of different models and algorithms for machine learning. Random forest, gradient-boosted decision trees uh, are very popular. And then for, for deep learning, it really is neural neural networks. And in terms of interpreting the data, it's harder to do in the, with deep learning methods. It, it's still possible and you can still really gain some interesting insights, but it's much easier, generally speaking, in traditional machine learning tools. And the computes a lot more, compute resources are a lot more for deep learning, where you really need a GPU to, to train uh, most models for uh, most interesting problems. And whereas for, something like a random forest, you don't necessarily need a, a GPU. Okay, so let's talk about, and so a lot of you are, I'm sure, are very familiar with it, but um, first I'm gonna talk a little bit about convection and how the United States National Weather Service defines severe convection. So a severe storm is one that produces a reported hail diameter of at least 25 millimeters or uh, a wind gust of at least 50 knots, and that can be measured or estimated through uh, damage like downed trees or the presence or uh, produce a tornado. So that is how the National Weather Service in the U.S. defines severe storms. So how do we get severe weather? Well, there are a variety of ways, but they basically all have four ingredients in common. Shear, lift, instability, and moisture. It's a mnemonic where basically we say without all of these, the chance of severe weather is slim. So it's very unlikely. So let's talk about each of these. Okay, I'm going to start with moisture. So as you guys all probably know, it's measured by dew point temperature. It's the temperature at which air becomes saturated and condensation occurs. So it really measures the moisture content, not as opposed to the relative humidity. Having a high level of moisture is particularly important in the in the lower atmosphere. Uh, storm needs storms need lots of moisture to uh, to produce you know hydrometeors and lightning. So instability. This is where the air will basically rise freely just due to positive buoyancy. So it's very analogous to a beach ball being held under and released held under water and, and released and it'll rise to the the surface. The um, metric we often use is called convective available potential energy. 
And this can be measured on something called a skew T log P diagram. But basically, to get really high levels of K, if you want warm, moist air near the surface and cold air aloft. And according to parcel theory, stronger cape results in stronger updrafts of storms. And, and those are particularly important for things like hail. Okay, lift. Well, you can have these ingredients in place, but you need something to, to be a forcing mechanism for the, the storms. These are things like low pressure systems, different fronts or dry lines, um, orography, outflow boundaries from other storms. This, this will help overcome any initial convective inhibition and, and get storms or air parcels to the level of free convection where they can tap into that available potential energy. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, is something called wind shear. It's simply the change of wind speed and direction, in our case, with, with height. As, as the little diagram shows, this really prevents an updraft from collapsing on itself. So it helps sustain the updraft, helps it intensify. And storms with very high wind shear, usually 45 or 50 knots or more, often become supercells where you, then you get in a rotating updraft and and um, all sorts of, all those hazards, winds, tornado, and hail are associated with, with supercells. Okay, I'm going to talk just a little bit about climatology in the, uh, in the United States, severe weather climatology. And this is basically when and where do, in our case, hail, wind, and tornadoes occur in, in the United States. And um, as you can see from the animation, basically anywhere in the U.S., severe weather can occur, but the eastern two-thirds of, of our country is where most of it occurs, and in our warm season, which is April through August, um, different parts of the country have different severe weather seasons. In the early sp spring, April, May, it's, um, eight, uh, Texas and Oklahoma have a lot of severe weather, and then that shifts northward and to the northern plains and eastern United States, and then in a cooler season, kind of December, January, February, the southeast U.S. has more of its uh, impactful, severe weather, but not, not quite as frequent, but can still be some pretty big outbreaks. Okay, so, and so this is a semi-regular shifting of SST patterns in the tropical Pacific. Most noticeable in, in the cold season. So here I've highlighted the uh, uh, the Nino, I was trying to move this out of the way, Nino 3.4 region. Uh, you guys are probably familiar with in the, in the warm phase is El Nino and in the cold phase is uh, La Nina where you have cooler than normal uh, SST anomalies. Okay, so this is how uh, we measure with that temperature difference. As you get more positive, it's El Nino. As you get more negative, it's a, a La Nina. So some researchers have looked at how does this affect, in this case, tornado outbreaks in the, in the United States. And this is a little bit out of date, but you can see the vast majority of large tornado outbreaks come in either neutral phase or cold phase, which is La Nina. And only one um, was in the warm phase. And I think this still holds true for the past 30 years as well. I can think of several large tornado outbreaks where it was neutral or uh, cold phase. And I know 2011 was probably the largest tornado outbreak in my lifetime, and that's right here. So it was a pretty strong, well, I guess, moderate to strong uh, La Nina. So how does, why is that? In the El Nino cold season, the storm track is, is further south. So here on the left is uh, the typical La Nina storm tracks. It's a little further north, kind of in the central United States. And El Nino, particularly in the cold seasons, so that's December, January, February. It's those low pressure systems are really hugging the southern part of our country and the Gulf of Mexico coastline. And this has been shown in uh, some other studies. This is Allen et al. 2015. 
So this is a composite uh, mean anomalies for hail on the left and tornado on the right. And the top is El, El Nino uh, for, this is in December, January, February, and the bottom is La Nina. I think you see El Nino for hail and tornadoes, you have a high, a stronger positive anomaly along the Gulf Coast. And in La Nina, if you have a La Nina in the winter, uh, that anomaly shifts further north. So you can see, especially for hail, not so much for tornadoes, but you can see how that tracks really nicely, nicely with these typical storm tracks. If we look in the springtime, March, April, and May, for hail and tornadoes, um, again, El Nino's on top, La Nina's on the bottom. You can see a, uh, a negative anomaly or a dearth of of hail and, and also tornadoes in the spring, but a very strong positive anomaly uh, for La Nina of hail in the southern, south central United States for hail and tornadoes. Now, La Nina and El Nino are actually most pronounced uh, for the United States and, um, or I guess maybe in general in the, in the winter months. So, but they can certainly persist into, into the spring as well. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a little context of some climatological signals for for convective um, climatology in, in the United States. Now let me talk about some of these machine learning models. So the first one's called Prob Severe Version 3. And like I said, this, this version 3, Prob Severe is a shortened probability of severe models. So these are models that incorporate environmental data or high resolution numerical weather prediction or NWP data, GOES imagery, so that's geostationary uh, satellite imagery, something called MRMS, which is basically merge, merge radar products that can see through clouds and sense the, the hydrometeors uh, within, within clouds. And then total lightning information, so that's cloud to ground and in cloud lightning, both from, uh, from space, from geostationary orbit and with ground networks. So Prosperior version three fuses all this together to predict the probability that any given thunderstorm will produce severe hail, wind, or tornado up to 60 minutes later in the future. And this is kind of what it looks like. This, the system on the left is what the National Weather Service in the United States uses to, to view, view data. But Prosperior are four, version three is four different gradient boosted decision trees. And it identifies and tracks storms in, in both radar and satellite imagery across the United States. And it extracts these, these features. So like, what is the flash rate? What is the satellite growth rate for a given storm? Um, what is the radar reflectivity? What is the rotation based on radar look like in, in these storms? And this is used operationally throughout the, the United States as a decision aid to help forecasters issue severe weather warnings. So something called like a severe thunderstorm warning or a tornado warning. And on, on the left here, you see all these, the background is radar composite reflectivity, kind of pretty analogous to rain rate. And then you see all these colored contours and they're the prob severe objects, storm objects, and they're colored by the probability of a severe weather. So you can see the color key up here as you get to the pinks, it's a very high probability of severe weather. And then these polygons that pop up, these yellow and red polygons are the warnings that humans are using or that humans issue to help warn the public that uh, severe weather is, is imminent. In the United States, all warnings are still issued by humans. Um, machine learning is really to provide a decision aid or, or guidance to the forecasters to help issue more accurate warnings. I'm going to talk briefly about some of the display of this because I think how you display your products is actually really important. You have to think about what your users want, what is most helpful for them. And for us, that is forecasters making these warning decisions. So forecasters often look at radar data. So we didn't want to fight that paradigm. We wanted to work with it. So we have just the outlines of our storm objects contoured around the radar data so they can still see the radar data, but get a lot of important information from the machine learning models. 
if a forecaster puts their hovers their mouse over a storm, they can see the specific severe weather probabilities for each hazard, hail, wind, tornado, or any of those hazards. They can also see different storm attributes like the vertically integrated liquid, the lightning flash ray, the cape, the shear, and, and so on. So this really helps forecasters to unpack the black box of these machine learning models and gain trust in, in their use in, in operations. Another feature in the systems, forecasters can click on a storm object and get a, a recent history of the different severe weather, severe hazard probabilities, seeing the trends forecasters have said that really help them decide whether to issue or not issue a severe warning, especially if they're, they're unsure if they've seen that storm has a history of producing severe weather or has really high probabilities and they're more likely to, to issue uh, the warning again. And this is just another way to get more information on the same display, everything in front of forecasters, so they don't have to waste time going to a new, another screen or, or something. So the probability of tornado, which is a particularly difficult and uh, hazardous phenomenon. So that's a separate contour that we, with a separate probability, still using this, this uh, color bar. So that's just how they can see both the probability of tornado, which I have a separate product to issue, that's the tornado warning, and the probability of any severe, in this case, it's the, the pink probability, the inner contour, and they use that to help issue severe thunderstorm warnings. So decision aids like ProSphere can really help forecasters perform something called triage or prioritizing the different threats in these busy situations where you have storms all over quickly developing. Some are only for um, have a hail or wind hazard and some have tornado hazards, some have all three. So forecasters really have to make quick decisions and uh, accurate decisions. And something like PropSevere helps them do that. This is a, just a example in the Northern part of our country in North Dakota, some storms, a uh, little part of a squall line heading up here and, and creating a lot of wind reports. That's what these little W's are. You can see how the, the warnings track really well with the, the PropSevere objects and as it hits this river valley, the, the probabilities are pretty high and produce a lot of significant wind damage. But from that storm, I want to just illustrate something called decision plots, which you guys will be looking at later with Scott. You, and this is part of uh, explainable AI. So understanding uh, which predictors, which features in the model are most important at any given time and in, in the gradient boosted decision tree. So at the top are the more important predictors. Basically you have a larger deflection to the right and those are the ones that are more important. So the lightning flash rate um, and then a few radar metrics, excuse me. <clears throat> Any deflections to the left are metrics that are decreasing the final probability. You can see here the low level lapse rate. So that's the environmental lapse rate. What's the difference in temperature from the surface to three kilometers above the surface? It basically cancels out the mid-level radar derived azimuthal shear or rotation in the storm. You can see how one is a leftward deflection and one is a rightward deflection of about the same magnitude. And at this point in the storm's lifetime, where it's a pretty mature severe thunderstorm, a lot of the environmental or NWP-based and satellite predictors are, are not super important factors. So we'll talk a lot more about decision plots uh, later. Okay, let me talk about intense storm nut. So this is a, a deep learning model used to identify convective regions with basically visual indicators of something from a satellite perspective that looks intense. It's, it's a qualitative measure 
But for those well-versed with satellite data, you kind of know when you see a certain um, satellite signal when that storm is really intense or severe. The inputs come from GOES. We use the visible channel. So that's the, uh, the red band, uh, 0.64 micron reflectance. We also use the 10.3 micron brightness temperature. That's as, as a two kilometer resolution, whereas the visible is half kilometer spatial resolution. And the, the 10.3 micron is in the infrared window uh, band range. We also use from the geostationary lightning mapper, something called flash extent density. And that's these blue bluish boxes in this toggle on the right. Uh, basically just how many flashes traverse a given pixel or area in a given amount of time. That's all that is. So it's kind of like flash rate. So this model um, can be used to produce some these intense convection probability maps where you see the color bar here. Again, the blue cyan contour is 50% probability of intense convection. The magenta one is 90%. And you can see that 90% contour is really honing in on the strong overshooting top and warm and cool uh, couplet. So this model is is utilized within the, the Prosperia version three models, which I just talked about, but it can also just be used as a satellite only now casting tool. It doesn't require radar, so it can be used anywhere within the GOES areas, uh, the GOES rings of, of uh, viewing. Let me talk really briefly about convolutional neural networks. So that's what intense storm net is. And it's a type of deep learning model that uses images in this in our case images as input and assigns importance to the various or uh, salient um, aspects or features in the, in the image to differentiate between our classes so there's simply binary classification we looked at a bunch of different storms and storm patches and label them either as intense or ordinary or, or not intense so it's just two classes convolutional neural nets learn salient spatial and multispectral features in the image. So it's not just the spatial aspects. It's not just the multispectral aspects from the, from the imager or the geostationary lightning mapper. It's both simultaneously. I kind of like this quote, just really simplifies what ComNets really do. The role of Kavna is to reduce the images into a form which is easier to process without losing features which are critical for getting a, a good prediction. So it does make some um, assumptions in these convolutions, but they're a really powerful tool and, um, you know, kind of the same technology that's used in self-driving cars, really. And this is what the model looks like. We have two different branches of inputs. One is from ABI, which is the Advanced Baseline Imager on GOES, and one is from GLM, or the Geostationary Lightning Mapper. So we have these image patches of flash extent density, or the two um, channels on ABI. And here we interpolate the two kilometer resolution channel 13 to the half kilometer resolution at, at channel two. And then there are several blocks of um, convolutions and pooling layers and the number of feature maps, which is this number here, doubles each time. And eventually it all gets flattened and concatenated together along with a few scalar attributes, latitude, longitude, solar zenith angle. So it just tells you, you know, how high is the sun basically? And then the satellite zenith angle or satellite viewing angle. It all gets concatenated, and there's a few fully connected layers um, uh, for neural network layers. And at the end, it's just one, for a given set of image patches, it's just one probability of intense convection. These are storm tracks in our dating database, training database. I think we um, manually me and several other researchers manually labeled something like two or 300,000 different image patches. 
I can see most of it is in the eastern two-thirds of the United States where most of our severe weather is, but there are some kind of in the southwest uh, U.S. I'm not sure who's drawing on my screen. <laughs> wonder if I can delete that somehow. Yeah, I'm not sure if that was me or not. I mean, my, I'm moving my mouse around, but... Uh... Yeah. You can also disable annotation as well. Um, uh, so uh, up at the top underneath more, the top of your toolbar, um, not the annotation toolbar. Okay. Uh, so if you go to the, the top of your toolbar, you should have a drop down. Um, and oh, over yeah. on more, be able to disable annotation. Okay. Now I need to delete the ones that are currently on there. Um, your toolbox oh. should have the eraser. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I like your lines, but they are <laughs> a bit distracting. All right. Thank you, Megan. All right. Let's talk about what intense storm net output looks like. So it works day and night, even though it uses um the visible the red band it it can be used on basically any any scan in, in the goes domains goes east or west like i said before it doesn't require radar data and you can see here we have this developing severe thunderstorm the imagery is something we call sandwich imagery where it's essentially putting together the the visible which is largely in the white and then the infrared from the 10.3 micron brightness temperature, coloring that um, at colder temperatures. And as that storm grows and develops, you can see uh, the probabilities increase rapidly. Uh, and one really interesting th thing you'll see on, on the next, as it goes again, uh, a storm that splits to the left and has enhanced probabilities right up here. And the model captures that pretty well. But you can see it's not highlighting the entire anvil cloud. It's really just the intense part of that storm, the areas where it's most likely to be producing hail or, or wind or even tornadoes. Okay. So I'm going to show a few more examples. This is with Goes's one minute mesoscale sector. So that's really nice because you get really rapid updates. This is in the state of Texas. I'll only pause that. You'll see these little dots pop up, and these are reported severe weather for hail and green wind and the blue and tornado in red. So hopefully, as you see this, you'll see that a lot of these reports are pretty well correlated with where we have the most intense parts of uh, storms that, that intense storm that is is labeling. And again, you can see uh, these these storms are. A lot of them are fairly stationary or slow moving, and it's really just highlighting the the strong overshooting tops, the really strong texture in the in the visible imagery, and not the entire cold uh, cold anvil cloud mass that envelops the the whole region. And you'll see in just a minute. Another neat thing is that it captures these storms that just erupt under that anvil and, and it's able to to do that as well. Okay. This is in the Southeast United States. This is a scene that has, I believe, um, a lot of linear convective structures mis mixed with some supercells, but there's a good transition from daytime to night. And which is, Ideally, what you want to see in, in a product, you don't want it to be very different, um, you know, just when the sun sets. So the lightning predictors and the infrared brightness temperatures help keep it consistent. And I think later on in the animation, uh, you get some reports where they have really small probabilities with them. And there is an underestimation of the severe threat when lightning is very low. This is in Argentina, also with a one minute mesoscale scan. There's reports of 
uh, widespread flash flooding, large hail, wind damage. I know there's 50 DBZ echo tops, at least to 20 kilometers on a few storms, one near Cordoba, uh, which is which is pretty strong. And you can see that Miles doing a good job of highlighting those, <clears throat> excuse me, those areas where it's most likely to be producing these these threats. Transitions to nighttime and it's still hitting the the strongest areas. That the color bar is not great. It really washes out some of those strongest uh, overshooting tops down in Argentina. Okay. Another tool you can use to help discover or elucidate what the model is learned, has learned or what it says is important is a permutation test. I won't go into it too much, but basically for each predictor, you um, randomize it or jumble it up among the other samples in your data set and then compute a, a skill score. And the one that reduces that skill score the most, we say is the most helpful for the model. So we did this on a daytime only sample so that the channel two reflectance could have equal possibility of contribution. And what we found is that the channel 13 brightness temperature from ABI was the most important. Uh, so you can see the cloud top brightness, brightness temperatures. You can see overshooting tops really nicely, but kind of surprising that the GLM flash extent density was, was more important than the reflectance. I thought it would have been the other way around with the reflectance. You can see also a lot of uh, strong texture in, in the cloud tops. It's also important, but the lighting information was particularly important. So this is just another tool in your toolbox you can use to, to unpack uh, these models. So we run this in near real time at the University of Wisconsin. And right now it's only over the contiguous United States or, or the CONUS, but you can actually uh, review output, but you can download output as well if you're interested in, in that. Okay, let me go ahead and talk about lightning cast this is also another satellite only deep learning model so lighting is a hazard for especially for power companies and for people that are outside and the model simply uses abi data in the visible bands in the short wave or near infrared and in the long wave infrared uh, window to predict the probability of lightning in the next 60 minutes so this model was automatically labeled with GLM lightning data. That's, again, it's geostationary lightning mapper. So that was nice. We didn't have to go through and manually label 200,000 little image patches. Um, like I said before, we are using the full resolution of these bands, half kilometer in the visible, one kilometer in the short wave infrared, and two kilometer in the long wave infrared. So this has some obvious applications to as an outcasting tool, but this could also be an interesting way to study convection for like climate studies. Let me talk a little bit more about this model. So it's a something called a UNET. So it's a type of autoencoder, a very popular type of model. And basically you get for a set of images um, image predictor. So in our case, it's four different channels here. You get a probability of lightning at any location within the next 60 minutes at every given pixel. In our case, it's the output is two kilometer spatial resolution. So here are the four channels used. These first three channels make up something called the day cloud phase RGB, which we'll talk about a little later, I think. With, with that uh, false color imagery or red, green, blue false color imagery, you can really see cloud top glaciation or convection that begins to turn from mostly water at storm top to mostly ice. And that's a really good indicator of uh, imminent lightning potential development. The second two, uh, the coupling of the second two bands, 10.3 micron brightness temperature, which is a clean window infrared and 12.3 micron brightness temperature is what we call the dirty window 
uh, infrared channel because there's more water vapor absorption. This is also termed the split window difference if you were to subtract the two. They, with the split window difference, you can see pooling moisture under certain dry conditions in the, for most of the atmospheric column. It's also important for ascertaining storm top height. So it could be both of these signals that the model is hinting at um, where it's saying that the 12.3 micron is, is really important. So we've tested a bunch of other bands from, from ABI. This was the combination, the four that seemed to really stand out the most. It was trained, like I said, on Go 16 GLM data. The flash extent density just accumulated over the next hour from a given ABI scan. GLM is a, an optical sensor. Uh, it has a little bit coarser resolution, eight, eight kilometers. Uh, but what's nice is you can, to some extent, see the spatial extent of each flash. It's not just one given point, like a lat lawn uh, point. Okay, so again, this is what we're trying to do. We want to objectively quantify uh, this imagery, such as the day cloud phase split window difference, and put a probability on where where is lightning likely to occur just in the next hour. Help people, help forecasters make products or decisions so that the public can uh, make decisions with respect to public safety. So this is what the lightning cast probabilities look like. Again, here's here's the color bar here. Um, just some really quick verification notes. We have, you know, we validate this across a large number of days and seasons, much better performance um, during the day, though it still predicts lightning initiation fairly well at night. Better performance in the warmer season, kind of April through October. This is something called critical success index. CSI goes from zero to one with one being better. And this is a um, reliability diagram where it shows how, given a certain forecast probability, how often do you attain the, um, the event frequency? So how often does it occur? So given a forecast of probability of 40%, for a well-calibrated model, you'd want lightning to occur about 40% of the time. And you can see there is some over-forecasting bias where we're predicting 40% forecast probability, and we're only getting about 25, 30, yeah, maybe, yeah, 25 to 30% verification. But, and importantly, we see some really good lead time to lightning initiation in a median sense, about 15 to 20 minutes of, of lead time. And, and that's really important because the first flash can be uh, really impactful and, and dangerous to, to people. Okay. And, this this slide just shows that we we run this on goes east and and goes west. Um, we also run a, a sector that goes down to about six degrees south, since there's a couple NOAA entities that forecast for the ocean, the offshore zones. Uh, we we have a sector over Alaska, Western Canada, American Samoa. We also have a sector using Himawari AHI data over Guam in their large area of responsibility. And we can do that, apply lightning cast to a sensor that it wasn't trained on because AHI is so similar to ABI. But um, and one thing we're also working on now is just to use some fine tuning methods to further enhance the accuracy of predictions in different parts of, of the world. Okay, so I'm going to show think, a couple of examples. This is the Florida Peninsula. The uh, background here is just called a natural color RGB. And you'll see these, these contours pop up with the probabilities, and then you'll see the, uh, the block, ah, the blue to yellow orange pixels are the uh, GLM flash extent density. So there's a lot to look at here. Maybe I'll let it go through a few times and point out a few things, but you see it, sea breeze, uh, convergence, 
along the coast here. You get upward development and and uh, thunderstorms begin to form. And hopefully you can see that in a lot of cases, you have higher probabilities before you have the first flashes. And I went through this and tried to measure lead time to the first flash. This is measured from the cyan 25% uh, probability threshold for the measured to the first GLM observed flash. You see the amount of lead time kind of ranges from 10 minutes to, to 50 minutes. There is, of course, lots of internal cloud and microphysical dynamics, which we can't see from satellites. So there's, there's lots of things we don't capture, but there's a, a good range of positive lead time to these, uh, to lightning initiation, and uh, there are relatively few false alarms. This is an example using one minute updates in the central part of the United States in Iowa. A little bit more complicated scene where you have some overlapping cirrus clouds, but with our eyes, we can still see some developing cumulus clouds underneath that. And the lightning cast model can see that as well with developing higher probabilities as these cloud tops begin to glaciate and, and grow vertically. And in this case, I think there was 20 or so minutes of probability to a lot of these different cells. Here's another tool we won't go into too much. Uh, another tool to see what's important or relevant to the predictions being made. This is using something called layer-wise relevance propagation. There's a couple of different methods or implementations of this, but it shows for each channel at each pixel, how important or relevant is that to the final prediction of uh, the probability of lightning. This is from the previous example in Iowa and this what we want to know is like the prediction here at this black X, which is right here, right next to this, this uh, convective cloud here, the probability was 58%. So what was important? A lot of things stand out that, you know, are fairly intuitive where you have the bright, bubbly looking cloud top in, in channel two, um, a little hard to see, but it's also turned to ice. That's what channel five tells us. So that's the snow ice band that's differentiates between, uh, uh, yeah, the snow and, and liquid water or ice and liquid water. And then also in channel 13 and 15, also highlighting the same areas where you have cold cloud tops. Okay, here's a nighttime example. And you can see it's really hard just looking at this. Where is there going to be lightning in the next 60 minutes? But I actually lied. This isn't a nighttime example. This is a daytime example. I just took out the, the visible bands and made predictions. So this is what lightning cast predictions are up here without the visible information. When we add in the visible information to the model, you get much better predictions. It can see this Q coming up through the, the moderate cirrus here. And so this is what it looks like the, the scene. So it really starts to highlight an area as soon as you can visually start to see those clouds poking up. And then of course you get some lightning in the, in the near uh, future. So this just goes to show that um, though as overall, it doesn't appear that the Viz and the near IR channels are contributing a lot. They are really important and especially in specific situations. So uh, this one being a nice example of that. You have to, excuse me, I'm battling a little bit of a cold. I'm gonna blow my nose real quick. Okay, this just another quick example, another way to view the data where you can see how at a given location, the probability of lightning, how does that change? And you can imagine if this is viewed in real time by a forecaster, they see a rapid and continuous increase in probability. They're looking at the satellite data. 
it's giving them confidence that the storm's going to produce lightning in the near future. And in this case, it does. And here, this was uh, convection it actually became severe in the New York state and um, dropped some hail and wind and affected these uh, a festival in a, a city called Syracuse, uh, New York, as it moved eastward. Yeah, so it's just another way to to view the data, both in the 2D fashion, a little bit different color bars here, but um, this is a, a lightning mediogram where we see not only the probabilities of lightning from lightning cast in this red line, but these blue dots are observed flashes from the geostationary lightning mapper. So forecasters use both tools to, to help discern the lightning potential at a given location or for a given a given region. Okay. We did look at lightning cast validation throughout, um, well, for the United States, Central America, and, and Northern South America. Uh, again, CSI's critical success index. It's basically the accuracy of a model leaving out true negatives or correct nulls, since a lot of those are pretty trivial to predict here. I like using CSI as, as a metric for rare occurring phenomenon. And, and lightning prediction in, um, in satellite imagery, is, it's fairly rare overall. But you can see we did a validation spatially to see how does it change versus land and water different regions and you can and this is just the number of events for each uh, location so it looks like uh panama venezuela and colombia are the the winners for a uh, number of lightning events <laughs> but if you look closely you can see that the model does seem to do a bit better over land than over water and that could be due to a few meteorological reasons Cloud condensation nuclei, I think, in some cases are harder to get or in as high of numbers over for over ocean. Uh, you can also see a little bit less skill in the Western United States. Part of that could also be due to the GLM's detection efficiency out there, which is not, not very good. So it's good to evaluate your model, not just with a few given statistics like one or two numbers overall but look spatially to look seasonally and maybe some very important cases like in the, our case lightning initiation so you really need to uh, validate your model over and over again in different ways okay so just wrapping up this part of the uh, the workshop so prob severe version three gradient boosted decision trees that fuse together these uh, radar, satellite, lightning, NWP data, as well as storm tracking uh, methods to provide probabilistic objective guidance throughout the United States uh, for the National Weather Service. Intense StormNet is a satellite-only convective now casting tool, which is used within ProbSphere version 3. It could also be used for a convection real reanalysis, it could be an interesting way to just track convective clouds over, over time and may produce some climatology. And lightning casts, also a convolutional neural network, but a, a UNet um, to predict lightning in the in the near term. It really excels at most lightning initiation type of situations. And lightning cast was automatically labeled with with GLM data. So I want to give a few points about machine learning in general, some some steps to consider as, as you go about making your own machine learning or deep learning models. One, I think, is to identify a problem. I don't think it's good to just make some type of model because you think it's cool and then see like, oh, what can it be applied for? Think about pro real problems you have in, in, in the world or in your countries and then think about uh, a solution to address that problem. So you need to choose your predictor data and truth data carefully. Is it, are you gonna do some hand labeling? Is it gonna be semi-automated or fully automated labeling? What predictor data 
can be pertinent to the task at hand. So your knowledge and expertise in, in the domain area is really important here. Um, also the type of data, how consistent is it? If it needs to be to run in near real time, is it reliable, is it operational, things like that. And you wanna choose your machine learning model. You shouldn't necessarily go with a convolutional neural network or the most complex model. It might be too much or overkill for certain problems. A lot of traditional machine learning models in certain cases outperform deep learning models. So something like a random forest or gradient boosted decision trees, support vector machines can still work really well for a lot of types of models or a lot of types of problems. Again, yeah, it's based on the, the problem and the data. I think it's a really good rule of thumb to start simple with your model, make sure everything works as expected and then increasing complexity. Don't go necessarily with the latest version of graph cast and uh, start with something simpler and work your way up and add complexity. So you have to, of course, collect and process this data. This is done locally or on the cloud. Uh, you have to use some computer programming to do that usually. Think about ways to identify, fix, or exclude bad data in your in your data set. And then train your model. So there's, it's actually in Python and I guess other languages too. There's some easy to use APIs. I often use, mostly use TensorFlow. Um, PyTorch is very good too. So it's, it's really just maybe personal preference. And then evaluate your model on new data. This is really important. Evaluate, evaluate, evaluate many different ways. Because once you put this in front of your users, there's no there's no hiding any, any issues your model might have. They want to see if the model's working well and where it doesn't, they want you to, to train them on. Oh, it works really well here. It doesn't work well here. And that helps build trust in your user base. Visualize your model output to users. So like I mentioned at the beginning, this is a very important, often overlooked aspect. This can help in kind of a co-development between you and your users for your model. And it just helps you find problems that you might have. You really learn where the model does well, where it doesn't. It's really, really important to what's called unit test everything. Your whole model and pipeline might work um, mechanically. You might not get any errors, but you could have some logic issues that are causing problems. So every step along the way, uh, check your output, check that everything's working as expected. And then, yeah, collect user feedback and go through this loop again, make changes, increase the data size, diversify the, the, the uh, training validation data, maybe look at some new inputs and, and so on. Okay, so hopefully you all learned a few things there. I think we're gonna take a short break. I'm gonna try to catch my breath. Um, so maybe we'll, we'll come back at, uh, I guess, 106, 107, do about a five minute break. Now I'm going to go through a notebook for, for deep learning, for lightning prediction, basically making that lightning cast model. I'm not going to execute everything in it because it just takes too long, but we'll put the link in the chat and you guys can go through it on at your own pace, on your own time. And um, so I'll just highlight a few points in there. And then we'll take a, another break. And then Scott will go through a notebook on the prob severe model, version three models, uh, predictor importance and use some of those show you how to use some of those tools so let's take a break and we'll reconvene in about five minutes or so and john i thought maybe at the start of the uh, when we're back um there's some questions in the q a that maybe you can answer because they're outside my knowledge base yeah that sounds good all right let's see you all at 107 um there are a couple of questions asking about the shareability of the code. And I know that CSPP is creating a distribution of lightning cast probability at least, but how are the, is, is the Python code that you've developed for prob severe and lightning cast and the stuff that Stephanie's done for intense storm net, is that something that's shareable? 
Yeah, well, this the CSPP Geo is all open source, right? So the code should be available through that, I believe. I think that would probably be the best way to share it. Right, but that's for Lightning Cast. Oh, somebody um, asked about the other models. Yeah, I wasn't sure. I'm not sure if they were asking about Prob Severe or which oh. ones, but for something like Prob Severe or for Stephanie's Intense Stormnet, is that a is that shareable code? Is it open source? Um, it it isn't. It can be. Um, we just need to clean it up and make it open source. <laughs> but uh, Lightning Cast is the most shareable one right now. Should they simply contact you then if they want? Yeah, want yeah. to pursue that? Okay, sure. Yeah, um, don't have my contact information, but I think it'll be on the uh, SAP mock page probably. I'm just answering a couple more of these questions. So the one I'm looking at. Is the what are the uncertainties and limitations of using AI to identify um, the location of high probability intense convection from satellite data images? Um, I know I know we've talked some about the thickness of cirrus prevents that, but are there any other things that come to mind immediately about that? Um, yeah, it's, it's a good question. Yeah. With the satellites, once you get clouds, it's really hard to see anything going on at, at the surface. So if there are some mechanisms that might be like undercutting convection and, um, stopping air parcels from tapping into the, to Cape or back to available potential energy, then you could potentially get some higher predictions whereas the storm is starting to die. So the it might get inadvertently get some false alarms. That's a possibility. Like Scott also mentioned, you can't under a thick cirrus anvil cloud, if there's some convection developing underneath that, you the models won't be able to see that until it starts to get above that cirrus canopy, especially for thick ice clouds. If it's moderate cirrus, it should be able to, to see that. So I'm gonna mark that as answered live. This question, do you think numerical models can effectively forecast unresolved scales using AI? considering the problem of unresolved scales in weather and climate modeling. I think he's asking about maybe using like NWP output to, to downs, downscale NWP solutions to higher resolution. Maybe those are like unresolved scales. Um, yeah, I think that's that's possible. It's it might make things look more realistic, which might be advantageous for certain users, but I'm not sure if it's actually more statistically accurate. But I have seen numerous studies use conditional CGANs, conditional generative uh, adversarial networks to, to do this. Um, so that would be a type of model to, to do some research on and to look into, see how people have used those to, to downscale any input, but numerical models as, as well. Um, and I'm not sure about the first question, the last question there, what is the LOR used? Do you know yeah, what? I asked, I asked for clarification. I'm not familiar with the LOR acronym. Yeah. And, and I'm wondering if it's OLR, but um, so hopefully, hopefully <laughs> some clarification can come by. Okay. I'm going to close the Q and A. Great. And just, I will put the link to the- Oh, there's a few more, but- Yeah, I, I'll, 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 I'll try to those. keep, I'll try to keep answering those, um, but I'll put the link to the- um, Oh, yes. 
Google collaboration into the chat. Yeah, go ahead and do that. Oops, we start at the top here. Okay, I'll give everyone a minute. So Scott has put in the uh, notebook link into the chat. Hopefully you can all um, click on that. If it's not at the top, just scroll all the way to the top and we'll... Whoops, that's the wrong one. Oh, no. <laughs> I, put, I put the one I'm going to be talking about. Oh, okay. Okay. I'll, I'll put the other one in. Okay. <laughs> there. This is the right one. One I put in. And you, you can just bookmark it for later. You can just look at my screen as we go through it, or you can try to follow along. Okay. So I'm going to talk about just some concrete steps on how to use machine learning to train a lightning now casting model. This is very, very similar, um, almost the same of how we train lightning casts, only this uses a lot less data. But basically, you just expand the amount of data you use, and you can um, train something like lightning cast. OK, so hopefully you'll have a better understanding of um, validation and some machine learning aspects, especially for deep learning. I'm going to talk about TensorFlow records a little bit and um, yeah, some overfitting and underfitting potential potentialities. But let me talk about the background of this problem just a little bit more. In my presentation, I talked about the daytime cloud phase distinction. RGB and it's formulated several different ways, but it uses the uh, 0.64 micron reflectance, that's the visible band, 1.6 micron reflectance, uh, the ice water discrimination band in the ice liquid water discrimination band in the uh, near infrared and the long wave infrared brightness temperature at 10.3 microns. So in this formulation, basically <clears throat> the background land is, is you know dark blue. Water clouds are uh, turquoise or cyan color. Thick ice clouds are orange to, to reddish. You can see my hopefully you can see my mouse right here. But importantly, glaciating clouds are just turning to ice are green. So this signal that we can see with our eyes is one signal we're trying to train a model to, to learn because we know this is indicative of, often indicative of future lightning. Okay, we talked about some considerations for the problem. We talked about our, our data set from Gozar, our data sources from Gozar ABI and Gozar's geostationary lightning mapper. All of this goes data is um, available freely on, on the cloud. One thing we use, which is a little bit different, is this free GitHub package called GLM tools. And this converts the level two GLM files where you have lightning, something called events, groups, and flashes. It makes flash extent density which is the, the, the spatially informed flash rate for, for GLM. It, if you're not doing this on the cloud, this might look a little bit different, but we make a environment and uh, install the GLM tools. Uh, we connect to the Amazon S3 bucket. And here's a function for gridding uh, creating these, um, there are several functions for creating the GLM flash extent density. This is just a function to download the files we want. Uh, here we execute it. And using this um, script, make GLM grids, this will make the flash extent density for one minute accumulations. And we do that for just an hour here. Uh, well, I guess actually two hours. Let me go here, some helper functions. Uh, and then all those one minute 
GLM grid. So right now, again, we're making the target data. All those one minute GLM grids get aggregated into 60 minute grids. That's what aggregate GLM grids does. I'm not gonna go through this too much. There are a lot of different fields, including flash area, optical, total energy, total optical energy. The one we're really interested in is flash extent density. So let me go ahead and hide, I forgot how I hide this. Let's hide that one. Okay. So now we have these aggregated um, 60 minute accumulations, but they're at uh, every five minutes because we're using the five minute scans from GOES 16 over the the CONUS, the contiguous United States. So it's a 60 minute aggregation, but every five minutes. So each sample is, there is some um, overlap in, in, the, in the lightning. Okay, we have our aggregated files, great. Now, like I mentioned before, it's always good to double check how does everything look? Is everything spatially aligned? Is it aligned temporally? One time uh, when I was creating the lightning cast model, I kept training the model to predict lightning in the previous hour from a go scan. And I couldn't figure out why the model wasn't learning what I thought it should learn. It's because I was trying to predict old lightning, not next hour lightning. And all that was because I had an error in how I was computing the, the date time for, for uh, the truth data. It took me about a month to figure that out. So you to check everything, visualize things when you can. I, this is just a quick and dirty plot. I don't have the map or anything like that, but um, this is over the, the CONUS scan, which is not only the United States, but uh, Mexico and the Caribbean Sea islands. And But you can see like, okay, it looks like there's reasonable amount of lightning for one hour. Um, so that looks good. Some scripts or snippets to visualize the GOES-16 ABI data just from the S3 bucket data, which uh, it's called level 1B files for ABI. So we're connecting to the uh, S3 bucket and opening the data set. And there are some simple conversions to reflectance for channel two and channel five. And then for brightness temperature, a little more complicated, but it's, it's pretty, it's still pretty simple. It's, it's just a couple lines getting the Planck functions and then computing the actual brightness temperature for channel 13 to 15. And then we plot the data. Here I said we apply a square root enhancement to the visible. Okay, good. This all looks good. This is, it's all geographically aligned. You can see some differences here in channel two. Up here you have some really bright clouds, whereas in channel five, I don't have color bars here, but darker means less reflectance. Uh, it's pretty, pretty gray, pretty muted. So that's because it's a ice cloud. Whereas you go a little bit further south, these are bright in channel five and in channel two. So those are indicative of water clouds. Channel 13 and channel 15 look very, very similar. And, and they are. But um, if you look closely, channel 15 is usually maybe a degree, a half degree to one degree colder than channel 13 in most cases because of the extra absorption from water vapor. And if you look at these two further south, so maybe in, in Central America or near the intertropical convergence zone where there's more water vapor, you can expect to see larger differences in the channel 13 versus channel 15. But everything looks good to me. So let's, let's keep moving. Okay, generating TF records, so TensorFlow records. So there are a lot of different ways to feed your data into a, a, a GPU. Um, if it's a small data set, just using something like NumPy arrays is super easy. But when you have a big data set, that becomes intractable. It's just too much data, too much RAM to feed to the GPU. It can be slow. It's not... It doesn't necessarily work on um, 
distributed cloud systems. So TensorFlow recommends using their binary format called TF records or TensorFlow records. And these are a little bit nebulous or it can be a little bit difficult to understand, but once you get some functions set and you know look at some of their documentation, which I've uh, reproduced here to some extent, then it, it's actually not that bad. And once you get it, you can just reuse it. One thing we're doing is byte scaling the data to save space. So there's a byte scale and an unbyte scale functions. So basically you're changing your data from floats into, into bytes. So you do lose a little bit of specificity or resolution to the data. And you can calculate what that, how much you might lose if you byte scale it. Uh, but for us, that wasn't wasn't a big deal. And you, you don't have to do the byte scale. It just saves disk space, that's all. Okay, and this is kind of one of the main features or main functions, this image feature. We'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, some more functions for parsing the TensorFlow record and, and creating an example. But let me, yeah, so here we are creating full example whole samples or, or patches. So the grid we're using at two kilometer resolution is 1500 by 2500. Well, we don't want to use the entire grid. I suppose you can, but there's, for a lot of scenes, there's a lot of area that just isn't interesting. There's no, there's no lightning in it at all. So we have patches of 480 by 480, and those are going to be our samples. So we go through each each scene, again, each scene is basically this size. And then we do patches of 480 by 480. And we check, is there a flash rate in at least one pixel of at least three flashes? For each batch size you feed the GPU, you want each of your classes represented. So in our case, it's lightning or no lightning so we thought the easiest way to do that is like well just make sure each sample has at least some lightning and that shows a threshold of three flashes simply because sometimes you get uh one or two flash pixels which are actually errors instrument errors so i wanted to just do a a really low tech way of doing some quality control okay so for each truth file so that's our GLM aggregated files for the next hour. For each truth file, I want to go through and start to organize the data in a way the TensorFlow record wants. So first we byte scale the data. We have um, a minimum value and a maximum value. And I think I defined these up here. Oops. Yeah, so these are these are the ranges that for each channel that we're that we're going over. So basically, for this is the truth metric. Flash extent density accumulate over the next 60 minutes. All right, we're going from 0 to 255. And essentially, anything over 255, we're just calling 255 flashes. And there should be nothing less than 0. And then this is in brightness temperature, brightness temperature, and listen reflectance which goes zero to one for channel five it's pretty rare to get really high channel five reflectances so we capped it at 0.75 okay back to here so our target glm aggregated we're byte scaling but again you don't have to do that and then we're expanding the dimension so we're adding a dimension a channel's dimension at the end so it should be number of x by the number of y by one, so it's three-dimensional. And we do similar things for channel two, channel five, channel 13, and channel 15, where we compute the brightness temperatures, the uh, reflectances, byte scale them, and then add the channel dimension. Okay, so that's for our each date time. And now we are going through our patches. And this is where the writing of the TensorFlow records actually occurs. We make sure that we have 
some decent lightning in the in the scene. And then you do this convert to tensor and serialize it into a dictionary with these keys. And then we send that to our create example function, which was up here, which is this, which calls the image feature function. And that's doing a lot of the heavy lifting actually. And that returns a TensorFlow example. And it can, uh, we write that out or serialize it. One thing to note, I'm using different resolutions. I'm using the two kilometer as kind of, two kilometer horizontal resolution is kind of my baseline. So for channel five, that's at one kilometer on the same projection, same domain. So I just simply multiply by two. And for channel two, that's at half kilometer. So I take the two kilometer Y and X and multiply by, by four. So I make sure I get the same patches uh, the same domain for each set of patches. Okay, so we created some TensorFlow records. And again, want to visualize the records. Here's a simple script for doing that. We unbyte scale the data so we can get it in more physical units. So I didn't put color bars on this. But this is a patch over, I believe, part of Mexico. And this is the Gulf of Mexico. And these three channels all look to be oriented correctly at the same time. Very good, that worked. And here's the flash extent density for 60 minutes. It'd probably be better to overlay it on one of these, but you can kind of see the lightning. It seems to be in the right spots. Um, there's some convection down here, probably corresponds to this, some storms here. Um, of course, there'll be some development of lightning over the next hour. Is the development of, of clouds and storms too that, that might not be apparent, uh, but that the lightning uh, is indicative that there were storms there. So like here, there's some lightning, but if you look at the corresponding spot in channel 13, it doesn't look like there's any uh, deep convection yet. But overall, this looks good to me. Okay. Training a model. All right, first we need to define the model. Um, I chose a unit since you get a prediction at every point and it's worked well a lot of other applications with this encoder decoder structure and these skip connections to help preserve some spatial resolution. The lightning cast model does get a little bit, the probabilities are a little bit smoother than a lot of applications for UNET. We use upsampling layers in TensorFlow to upsample the two kilometer, one kilometer bands to the half kilometer channel. And um, uh, the formula is gone, but we use binary cross entropy. So again, this is, was there lightning at a given pixel? Or was there no lightning? Those are our two classes. Here are some hyperparameters we defined. We use many fewer feature maps per block. You can see here in the original model, they started with 64, they went to 128. So this is the depth, um, the depth dimension of, of each block, 256, 512, and then in their bottleneck, they use 1024. We tried that and it just was not working. I, I think it wasn't training well or wasn't converging, but using many, a lower, much lower amount of feature maps seem to work. And this, these are things you can test. There's different activation function. I like leaky ReLU. There's also ReLU, which is really easy and uh, works well. ReLU stands for rectified linear unit. Uh, you want to test the, the learning rate and some other different uh, aspects. These are the, si the, the sizes of our inputs. So we essentially have three inputs, a half kilometer input, a one kilometer input, and a two kilometer input. And you can see the two kilometer input, we concatenated channel 13 and 15. So that's why 
the last dimension on our third input is two. So there's four channels, but three inputs. Okay. We set up our CSI metric. Again, that is accuracy, but leaving out the, excluding the true negatives. And we do that for several different probability thresholds, every 5% between five and 50. Um, mean squared error, it's also called the Breyer score. And then the area under the precision recall curve. So these are all of our metrics. We do have accuracy in there, but I don't tend to look at that one too much. Okay, so we set up our metric. Um, here's the UNET definition. I'm not gonna go into this. You can sort through and see how the different blocks are made from our from our hyperparameters that we defined above. But there's the here's where we're doing the resampling or the upsampling if needed, the encoding branch, the bottleneck, the decoding branch. And then you have to compile your model. Oh, and use a use a optimizer. Atom is a really good general purpose optimizer. Okay. Training the model. All right. So we have another function. Uh, this one not only uh, binarizes our truth data, uh, but it gets our our uh, predictor data. And so when we binarize it, right, our lightning data has some flash rate, zero to two fifty five. But we really only care if there's any lightnings. So you binarize it at we binarize it at one flash. This has to be in byte scaled. In my case, it has to be in byte scaled uh, data units. Uh, we could train a model to predict 20 flashes in the next hour, or 50 flashes, uh, but we really just, for our purposes, just care about any lightning. So that's where it's doing the binarization. And um, it's getting the different inputs. Channel 2 is input 0, channel 5 is input 1, channel 13 and 15 together is input 2. Okay. These are just some helper functions get best model that is uh, just getting the one with the lowest loss since each epoch if the validation loss decreased we save out a an h5 model a, uh, a tensorflow hdf okay now i'm getting to the part where we're actually going to do the training i have note well there are several problems with our current data and setup uh, due to resource limitations, we only use eight samples for training and six samples for validation. That is not going to generalize very well. You need many more, much more data. Um, this is these notebooks are really just playgrounds to test things out. But um, you can use other local resources or cloud resources to to train a to real a model or you know a model that will generalize better. The samples of the training validation sets are also too close in time. This all correlation can cause overfitting on certain features and lack of generaliz generalization. It would be better to use samples from different days in each data set or ideally different years. So I, I see this problem a lot when I review papers, people say they get really good scores and they do, but all their data is very correlated between the training and validation sets. So you don't want that. You want those to be as uncorrelated as possible. And obviously with your test data set too. Um, yeah, I say I don't, I'm not using a test data set here, but you you should in, in your models, in your process. I leave these important considerations as an exercise to the reader. Okay. So now this is the driving code for training the model. We create a TF record data set with these TF records, which we're just globbing the file names. Um, we parse them out. This map just applies the parse TF record function to each sample in, in each TF record file. Uh, we prepare it. So this is just getting and unpacking the sample, binarizing the, uh, the target data. And then we, uh, our batch size is only one here, but batch it. Prefetch it helps optimize 
the communication between the CPUs and the GPUs. And we do the same thing. So this is our training data set. Then we do the same thing with our validation data set. We define some, some callbacks, some logging, early stopping. So that's if you have no improvement after, in our case, four epochs, then we, we stop because we don't want to overfit on the data. Um, we reduce the learning rate if, if our validation loss doesn't increase after two epochs. There's a lot of different ways to do this. I found this works really well. Some people use the same learning rate on each epoch, um, but I invite you to explore how to, how do you, what learning rate works best for your problems and how to adjust that as the training goes on. And then we use TensorFlow's Keras fit function, high-level API. Um, we give it the training data set, the validation data set, the callbacks list. We're going for 100 epochs, but again, there's going to be early stopping, so it never gets to 100. And once that's done, we can create some figures. So here's just printing out the model. Here's a graph of how the loss looked like. So it's, you know, that first one or two epochs that decreased a lot and then it was pretty gradual. But again, this is a very, very small amount of data. Accuracy and some scores. So I really like looking at the validation CSI and you can, there's ways you can make that your, your loss function. Binary cross entropy is what I used. But um, uh, that's another important consideration. Like, what is your, what, what score do you usually look at to assess models and maybe see if you can create a loss function out of that? Um, but okay, it's not CSI is pretty bad, twenty percent below, twenty five percent below. But then it's actually pretty good uh, as you get a little higher. But again, the data are correlated, and there's only like six samples, I think. But there are a lot of pixels in your sample. Okay, now let's see how the model does with new ABI data, never seen before. So we're using some similar code snippets from before. I have a few things hard-coded in here for where I want to take a patch from to, uh, to make the predictions. And here we go. Now these are probabilities of lightning from our model over, I believe, the Florida Peninsula. Okay, well, that looks good, but we need a little more context. So let's get some GLM data, create another uh, aggregation. Here we're just subsampling our predictions. Okay. So let's look at that. You can kind of see the Florida coastline a little bit here in, in the channel 13 brightness temperature. You can see the lightning cast, well, it's not lightning cast, but the, the model's predictions, uh, yellow, orange, and red here. And you can see it corresponds to where we have. This is just current lightning. It's not lightning over the next hour. But at the very least, it's predicting where you, it's predicting well where you already have lightning. So that's good. And like I said before, it's um, the probabilities overall everywhere are probably too high. I think everything is like 25 or 30% and above. But using more data will fix this problem. But on a very small data set, it's at least learning something that seems reasonable. And then there's some, some exercises at, at the uh, bottom. Okay, well, hopefully you have this link and you can digest it more on your time. And um, you can email me if you have questions. And hopefully this will be useful in some of your research, maybe using TensorFlow TF records. I know those were kind of confusing when I first looked at them and just give you some more important considerations to think about in, in your work and your research. And I think I'm going to answer a few questions. Well, I, I, I answered one, but I, I thought I'd get your comment on this as well. So um, Hatam Ezidi asked, do AI results vary significantly when different satellite channels are used to analyze the same variable? 
So for the lightning cast example, you use band two. Did you see what happens when you use band one instead of band two? Or did you use like your meteorological knowledge to say, okay, these are probably the bands that are going to be the most useful? Yes. Yeah, definitely the latter. Though we did, we didn't look at too many other visible bands, but we looked at a lot of different IR bands. There is a lot of correlation between the IR bands, um, but we have seen, this is kind of some current work, we have seen the uh, channel, was it 11? So that's a cloud phase band. I forgot the... Uh, 8.6. 8.6, thank you, Micron. That has shown some improvement in performance, but we're kind of evaluating like how significant is that. It's not very high, but um, we yeah we have looked at a lot of the other long wave infrared channels, but not so many. It's not so much the uh, viz or short wave. And there was also a comment in the chat about Kamagorov Arnold networks, and if they're wondering if you're considering exploring those. And there's a link to a PDF of a paper in review, I think. So I I'll, I'll just, people, but I, yeah. I don't know enough to, uh, oops, I don't know enough to comment on yeah. that. Yeah. Um, okay. Let me, okay. So that one's done. So Scott, why don't we reconvene at eighteen fifty UTC? Does that sound good? Sure. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Um, John has put into the uh into the chat the link that I'm showing on my screen. So John has all the knowledge about prob severe and lightning cast and how it's produced. And he's created this Google collaboration to help you understand a question that I'm frequently asking him when I go into his office and I'm looking at a specific case. So I'm a user of PropSevere and of Lightning Cast, and I'm always asking, well, which of these variables is most important for this particular case? So, for example, with, with PropSevere, you have things like low-level low azimuthal shear. Um, you have things like maximum expected size of hail and a, a whole bunch of other things as well. And I'm always kind of curious for a particular event, what is the most important predictor? Um, so this is going to help you understand that. Um, and you can run through this as I'm doing it as well. So, so as it says, by working through this notebook, um, you'll get a better understanding of the predictors in severe weather now casting so it's going to give you some a better feel for you know, if you're if you're developing a model this is what's important for the united states but the morphology of severe weather in your country might be a little bit different uh, the the geography here is probably different from the geography in your in in your country um you might be an oceanic uh, country and the prob the severe weather there is going to be driven by thunderstorms that are a little bit different from the supercells that we get in the U.S. But John mentioned slim, shear lift, instability, and moisture. These are the things that are necessary um, for severe weather. You know, sufficient shear, adequate lift, uh, instability, and moisture. So different kinds of measures of that are going to be incorporated into these models that are predicting whether uh, severe weather is going to occur. And remember, the definition of severe weather is the United States National Weather Service definition, which is winds exceeding 50 knots, hail over an inch in diameter, or a tornado. So let's continue down. And there are different kinds of convective storms that will that form in different environments that can still produce severe weather. So we have squall lines and supercells, but the United States will also have derechos, which are long-lived wind events. Um, 
there are quasi-linear convective systems that can develop, uh, can that can produce severe weather. You can have wet or dry microbursts. All sorts of different things that are that a model that's predicting whether or not severe weather is going to be occurring has to consider. So that it's definitely not a one size fits all things. You have to have a model that's flexible enough that it works with all of these different modes of convection that might be creating severe weather. So that's what we'll be looking at in this. Oops. That didn't mean to jump so far down. And my issue, let's go back up here. So we talked, John talked about prob severe, which is using satellite data, radar data, lightning data, both GLM, the geostationary lightning mapper that's on GOES-R and ground-based lightning, um, and some environmental attributes that come from numerical models. So it's this this can be traced for um, the, the germ, the idea for this started um, 15 or well, 2008 when people at SIMS were looking at cloud top cooling. So just looking at the how the change in the brightness temperature in the long wave infrared was cooling. So if it cools very quickly, that is interpreted as, ex as explosive growth and you're more likely to have severe weather. Um, and you can also look at cloud glaciation. So we're looking at prob severe version three now. Um, there was a prob severe version one and there was a prob severe version two. And with each refinement um, of the of the prob severe model, so it's a different machine learning, it's a different development in the machine learning. Um, this tool has become more reliable. It's better better statistics with it. Okay. Couple of things to think about or to explain here. Um, Shapley values. Um, this is a game theory concept that's part of prob severe and machine learning. So we're looking at uh, prob severe is acting on a feature. So you have to define a feature, um, and for that feature, you define the various characteristics that are with both the radar, the satellite, and the numerical model output. Um, so the mean values of these different observations from both the satellite, the radar, and numerical model are averaged for this shape file. And it helps you better articulate exactly where the probabilities are going to be greatest. So there's a Python library that allows you to do that. Um, so, so allows you to calculate the shape files. Okay, I wanna make sure I didn't miss it. Okay, so first things we're gonna do here, we can run all of these things. So you can, you can do this as well. Um, I'm gonna ignore that it's not authored by someone in Google. This one, this one takes a while because it's getting all the packages. I think when I ran that this morning, it took about 40 seconds, but you can see what it's, a, you can see the different uh, libraries that are installing. So light GBM, SHAP and pandas, it's running a little bit faster than it did this morning. So that's kind of nice. So that's done. Um, now we get need to get the, 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 the data that we're going to be looking at um, for this. So we'll, we'll download the probabilities of the, any severe hazards model. So I I look at these things like these are pickled sicket learn classifiers, uh, but we're trained using the light GBM package. Um, I love pickles. So that's that's what I think. And so everything has been the data have been downloaded and we can list it out now and you see what kind of uh, pickle files have been have been loaded.
now we're importing and loading up the Python libraries that will determine which of these features are most important. So that's what this uh, importance function has just has just been done. You can you can you know afterwards um, you can go through this and see um, exact. You can go through this again um, and maybe get a better understanding as you look at this yourself. So you can see all the things that that this is doing. Um, as it goes through in, in this Python code. So John has also written a helper function that makes the uh, makes the output a little bit easier to read. Oops, did that did that run? Never quite know. Oops. You can run it again. Yeah. I have to go back. There it is. It's fast. It ran. Let's just take those off. Okay. So John has created in here um, the data and the information for a variety of different storms. So you can we'll be able to see in this exactly how the different parameters in Propsevere, um, how are, how important are they for these different environments? So the first thing we're looking at is a supercell that did not produce a tornado. Um, this, this is an interesting one because it's a right mover and a left mover. Um, so the, the animation that you're seeing right now is showing the Propsevere polygons so you notice that the um, the feature that's that's being contoured is a radar image of the splitting storm. So you notice it splits in two, and the one that moves off to the right, the right mover, has slightly higher probabilities than the one that moves off to the left. Those yellow boxes are severe. Um, severe thunderstorm warning polygons that have been put out by the National Weather Service. So you have both these left and the right movers um, having, you have both these left and right movers developing characteristics that lead the Weather Service to be issuing severe thunderstorm warnings. And Prop Severe has also highlighted them. So John talked about the importance of using Probsevere's triage, you'll notice that at the end of this animation, another thunderstorm develops in this county. It's gonna show up right here, but there's no, even though even though it's warned, um, Probsevere isn't highlighting it quite yet. Maybe it, does it, maybe it does a little bit later. So maybe that would help you if you're monitoring this event with radar, maybe that would guide you to look at that system that's developing not quite so frequently as the fully developed systems that are moving in uh, right now. But Probsevere, I mean, they have put out a warning on it. So perhaps the environment is sufficient that the forecaster is applying their meteorological knowledge to say, okay, this is gonna grow um, with time and become severe. Okay. And there's also this blog post you can read about this, but I'm not. I won't click on that. But you can go through this and click on the links here to look at more content that that better describes. So we're looking at something that's between 23 and 0 Z, and if we look at this animation here, uh, this is a visible animation, and there's the storm going. So between 23 and 0 Z, you can see a storm split in the visible imagery, and then the sun sets. Um, so this animation starts at 20Z, so we can see kind of the, the, cumul the cumulus field developing. Here we have the storm is going to be in forming here, and then you start to see the storm split where we have the two different towering, the two different towers um, that you see a little bit easier in the radar. 
And if we look at the infrared at the same time, again, we're starting at 20 Z and the interesting, interesting thing starts between 23. So we see the convection developing and then we see this split where we have two different cold two different regions of cold cloud tops. So predictor importance for this is run through here. And we're looking at something at 2256 right now. So it's getting the information and then it's trying to figure out what's the most important uh, predictor in the prob severe model as far as um, what's driving the probability in the prob severe. <clears throat> What predictor is most important in driving the probability in the model here? And you see for, for this particular time at 2256 UTC, so at 2256, the lapse rate, the low level lapse rate is the most important parameter. So we see all the different things that go into the prob severe model. So mix, mixed layer cape, effective bulk shear, normalized satellite growth rate. So this is a satellite, you know, it's this is kind of related to cloud top cooling. So it's how how is the how is the cloud top brightness temperature changing with time and it's normalized. Flash rate is coming from the GLM. Um, we have as as a, a word I can't say as a muthal shear. Um, all sorts of different ver variables that are coming both from model and from the MRMS, which is the multi-radar, multi-spectral um, National Weather Service uh, observation system. And there are there are even things like precipitable water, um, height of the the zero degree wet bulb. So all sorts of prob all sorts of different observations that go into driving the ultimate probability that something might be happening. You can do the same thing an hour later, 2344. So we have the, a timestamp here. So if we run this again, then you can compare the shape file. So at 20, Got the 2344, you'll notice the most important thing here is the observation of the maximum expected size of hail or the mesh. So it's observing 1.25 inch hail. So you might expect that since that is a severe hail size, that that is one of the more important things in driving the prob severe model. Lapse rate zero to three kilometers is still giving you useful information. You'll notice it's still 8.4 Kelvin per kilometer, um, whereas before it was also 8.4 Kelvin. So you'll notice how the mesh has changed. It was, the value was 0 0.33, so not very important in the prob severe value. But then when the mesh goes, gets very high, it becomes a more important, um, it becomes the most important variable that's controlling the output of prob severe. So I really like this because it helps you understand how is prob severe getting the information or how is it getting the values that we're seeing? So that's for a non-tornadic splitting supercell. So you can do this for all sorts of different things. So here we have a, a wet microburst. This happened in the city, U.S. city of Memphis. So this is the Mississippi River. Memphis is right down here. And here we have the visible imagery, again, something that's happening <laughs> just at sunset. But you can see the uh, overshooting tops really well here. Um, I will I will click on this one. So Memphis, I have clicked on this one. I think I have this. Yeah, so here is the radar for that particular event. So you can see the outflow boundary, and also the velocity. So this wet microburst happened to have a big impact on the Memphis, um, on the Memphis airport. Okay, let's see if I can. So 
back here. I had to make things smaller and bigger to, so here's the visible imagery and you can see the same thing with the infrared. Um, the microburst was occurring um, around sunset. So you can, I mean, I like looking at the infrared imagery here because you can see the blackness of the cold cloud tops. There's one right there and then it collapses. And that's one of the things that's driving this microburst. The, the downdraft from that collapsing overshooting top is something that is going to be driving Prob Severe in this case. So 2348, if we click on that one, it's going to create the same kind of shape file. So you'll notice this is a lot different. Um, really only the lightning is the principal driver here of the severe weather. All of the other things aren't contributing a whole lot. The mesh is giving you a, the mesh is kind of giving you some, a signal, but most of the other parameters that go into prop severe here are not important. Um, so I think, I think when you look at these over, over the course of time, you come to understand the challenge in predicting just from observations, not from a prob severe model, just from observations, predicting where the severe weather is going to happen because um, these um, predictor importance plots really highlight how variable um, how the how the how variable the param how the how how variable the distribution of parameters can lead to a severe weather event, um, and it it kind of highlights why you need to do this kind of um, probabilistic predictors because it's the machine learning tools using the past data that's able to aggregate all this information. Um, you know, maybe there are forecasters out there who have seen enough severe convection that they're doing this all in their brain anyway. I'm not one of those, um, but the, the the beauty that Prob Severe is that it's doing this for you based on what it has learned and then it's projected into what, what it's observing right now. Okay. Okay, I've lost, which one is this? Yeah, did you, Scott, it's John. Yeah. Did you mention the two different ways to interpret the predictor importance? There's like logit, which is in probability space. And then there's, I think it's called identity, which the values don't really mean anything, but the... uh the size, yeah, right here. The size okay. of those bars are directly additive or they're proportional, basically. But they are in the same order. Yes. Yes. It would yeah. be the same order. So yeah. it's going from most important at the top to least important down at the bottom. Yeah. they. I haven't quite figured it out, but the negative ones, sometimes they just insert those. I guess it's... It, See how the mean wind is low and it deflects to the left quite a bit. The the fourth one, oh, scroll up a little bit. So when it does, down. when it's lower than higher than lower? Yeah, so the mean wind is detracting quite a bit. I think it puts it next to the lapse rate just to show like that those are similar in magnitude. Okay. So it's it's important in a sense that it's detracting a lot. So it's not as, but the, like the vill underneath it is contributing positive much more than the, the mean wing because that's deflecting to the right. Okay. So this is, so the, 
so the takeaway is that it's it's ranking the importance here but some of the importance is that it's contributing or it's con or it's reducing yes so something like flash rate is contributing to it something like the mean wind because it's this is the mean wind one here's the vil max so mean wind and effective bulk shear are both important but in a negative way yeah the highly negative values right you can see the you know, that's 11 12 knots for the effective shear and 10 knots for the mean wind so it's not particularly strong right and if you go up here you also see that kind of negative value relative to what's underneath it So is that also? Sorry, what's that? I'm saying that you you see the same yeah. kind of structure here. It, it is. It's just um, not as obvious. Yeah. Okay. So when you're doing this, okay. So the identity is better emphasizing yeah. what's important versus on less important or. What's positive versus what's it's not? It's more accurate, whereas the other one's more interpretable because it's in probability space. Right. But it's not as exact. So as I said, show both. So here we have another one. This is a dry microburst over Salt Lake City, which is a fairly dry environment. One of you asked why there's no why there's not quite so much severe weather over the mountains of the US. And I think the short answer is there's a lot less moisture there, but you can have, here's a, here's a nice example with a sounding dry adiabatic below 600 millibars. So you might expect very strong downburst with this. If we look at the visible animation, I'm um, going to again focus between 0, 030 and 130, you'll notice a convective system happening up here, again, as the sun sets, so we have a very strong system that develops, that does produce a dry microburst. And if we look at the same thing in the visible imagery, this is band 13, the 10.3 micrometers from GOES 16. You'll see a very strong storm develop. Let me show you the times. Again, a very strong system developing over the northern part of the Great Salt Lake. You see the cold cloud, you see the cold cloud tops, and then you see the collapsing overshooting top, which is helping to drive that microburst. So what's important for this kind of storm? And if we look at it, and again, we're looking at the identity. Um, this is at 116 UTC. Here's another case where the mesh is important, the flash rate is important, um, and so is the lapse rate. So those are the three most important values here. And so normalized satellite growth rate, um, zero. I'm not sure if that means it's not observed or if it's actually zero, but that is contributing. Um, that's a negative influence on the on the prob severe values. And the takeaway again is how you're getting severe weather from all of these different types of thunderstorms, but the parameters that are important in the probability that you're going to get severe weather are varying um, from storm to storm. So ProbSevere is helping you determine what's the most important. So here we have a tornadic supercell. Here we have a tornadic supercell. And in this case, we have ProbSevere output. Um, you'll notice that the objects here that are contoured um, I'll have double contours. So the outer contour is the prob tor value, 
and the inner contour is prob severe. So you're getting a estimation of the of whether or not you have will have severe weather, and you have a separate estimate at the same time on whether you'll have a tornado. Of course, a tornado is severe, um, but it's nice to be able to have one figure that shows a forecaster two different types of information. So John talked a lot about the importance of how you display the information to a forecaster. Um, that's something that you should not be ignoring. You should be interacting with a forecaster and getting their ideas on how to best present your information. So the yellows, the yellow polygons here are the, again, the severe thunderstorm warnings from the National Weather Service. And the red one, uh, so just the red ones, yeah, there are two, there are more than one, um, are the tornado warnings. So that's where the weather service is warning that a tornado is either likely or imminent, imminent or occurring. And again, if you click on these, see this blog post for more details on the storm, it'll, it'll give you some background context, context that might be useful. So those warnings are coming up around 23Z. I don't know why I made these animations so long. Um, so a couple of hours before that, and then up to 23Z. So you see the, you see the tornadic system, some nice examples of both Above anvil cirrus plumes are showing up here. When I show you the infrared imagery, we'll probably see some overshooting tops and maybe some enhanced enhanced Vs as well. But we have storms that are developing above anvil cirrus plumes that are, so we have a plume here, we have a plume here. And these are highly correlated with the development of severe weather. So you can use both prob severe, um, you can use and then combine that with um, what you see in the satellite imagery. I'm always telling forecasters when I'm doing training, don't rely on one thing. There's no such thing as a silver bullet. But you synthesize all this information that you have, and it'll help you get get it. It'll help your forecasters arrive at the at a better decision. So here we have the infrared imagery. Again, this this is starting kind of early. Um, the severe weather is going to be happening around 23Z. So we see the strong convection happening. Um, we have lots of very cold cloud tops here. So lots of overshooting tops. Um, I think if this wasn't animating, it would be easier to pick out the enhanced Vs and the, um, and the uh, above anvil cirrus plumes that are probably showing up in the infrared imagery, but I find that a lot harder to do in an animation. So my bad for not including some still imagery in here. So what features are important for this one? Oops, okay. This is a 22Z, which is before um, which is before the tornado, but you see um, a lot of a lot of shear, um, a lot of cape, all these things that you might expect to see with severe weather, great lapse rates or um, very steep lapse rates, all sorts of things that look really good. Even the mean wind was, was it about 31 knots. So let's change that time. So this is a 2214. And the and the example says to change the time to 2228. All you need to do is change this to 28. And we'll see how that change. Oh, I always do that. And then you'll see how it changes with time. So that's just 14 minutes later. Um, and you'll see that now the azimuthal shear is much more important in deriving the prob severe value here. And if you don't remember what it looked like at 2214, 
So where was azimuth al shear then? It was down much farther down. So the the azimuth al shear is coming from the MRMS. Again, the multi radar, multi spec, multi multi radar, multi sensor. Thank you, sensor. I was going to say merge, spec. merge yes. radar yes. data from multiple radars. <laughs> um, so notice how the azimuth al shear has changed greatly just in that fourteen minutes. So it's a nice way to be able to track what's going on. You might remember that John was showing in his talk. You can you can mouse over and see how the values are changed, see what the values look like. So you could be doing this in real time horizontally, but this is giving you that readout um, to give you the relative importance. So, you know, it's, maybe it's a lot easier, well, I'm trying to think if, I mean, if I'm, it's a way to synthesize all the information into one um, that doesn't require you to look at everything all the time. Um, so because that's a challenge when you're in warning forecast mode to integrate all this information into one thing. So if this isn't available in real time, but post post storm, you can look at this to figure out where and when were these different variables changing um, in relationship to the development of the uh, of the severe weather. So this is also at 2228, but it's looking at, wait a minute. Shouldn't we be looking at not identity, but logit, lo, lo, yeah. Okay, yes, that was the question. Okay. Here. I think there was an exercise there you're supposed to yeah change right. a couple of things. Yeah. Wow. Why would I like this to just run if I hit return? Okay, did it make the plot? Yes. So in this case. Are there any predictors that are reducing the final probability of the tornado? And I'm not sure there are based on this particular. We don't see any of those inflection points that we saw in the previous plot with with logit, log, log it. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Um, we just see progressively smaller values. So they're important, but not detracting. So this was a pretty, um, this environment was for tornadoes was, I guess this, I guess I should, what I should say is this was a very conducive environment for tornado genesis. Yeah. This is John. If you scroll up just a little bit, so you can see that, uh, keep going a little bit more. Oh, I guess that's, the table, the printout got a little bit cut off, it looks like. Can you scroll within that a little bit? Yeah. Go up to the top. Oops. Oops. Yeah, right there. So there's a table that has the predictor, the value, and then the SHAP value. So you can see, and that's in the, um, the identity. So you can see those two negative ones at the bottom. Those ones, okay. actually, it's hard to see in the graph, but the, yeah, the surface... LCL height, which is the lifted condensation level, and the, um, what was the other one? The storm relative helicity is slightly reducing the right. probability. But the LCL height, 1,700 meters, that's fairly high. So that right. kind of makes sense. So if you look at the actual shop values, and now... That that's what would be plotted if if you use the identities that have the logic. Right. Yeah. 
but it, but 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 before we were talking about how if it's plotted here and changes, it's so you have a little. Let me scroll up. So this kind of thing, where. Yeah, in in the in the printout, I think I just organized it so it's all positive first, all positives first, and all negatives at the bottom. So okay, I could control that. I couldn't with the API I was using. It decided where to put the negative ones. And okay, yeah. So here's an example from this year, earlier this year, where we had, uh, these are the US states of Iowa, Nebraska, Missouri. So this is in the Great Plains. And I think you can see the interesting part of the weather there. So there's a beautiful dry line with very strong convection forming on it, um, right underneath the upper level low. Um, so you might expect the shear here to be, to be pretty wildly good for severe weather. Um, here we have the infrared imagery for the same time. So it's it's fairly early in the convective season. So these storms aren't getting super cold. Um, what was this, March? Okay, April 26th. Um, so the storms don't get to, you don't see a whole lot of very cold cloud tops with them, but they are producing severe weather. Um, let's just look at the visible again to see if we can see I wasn't looking to see if I saw an above anvil cirrus plume with them. Um, I wouldn't be surprised, but let, let's see. Uh, we don't. Well, maybe I don't see it. So maybe there's just not enough upward motion with this particular system to punch into the stratosphere, although that, that kind of surprises me. So here we have 1834. So let me run this to see what happens. So a highly sheared environment with lots of cape and very strong winds. Um, so it shouldn't be a surprise that a tornado is going to be forming. So this is going to be generating the prob four values. Um, so everything here looks pretty impressive. So if we go back to this instead of instead of identity, ah. see what happens. So the neg I think so you're supposed to change the uh the time too. Okay, so that but, but yeah. I I wanted to see what it Sorry. was for that particular. Sorry. And everything looked pretty. Everything looks pretty good for that particular time. Nineteen oh eight. So by 1908, middle level lapse rate is a little bit. So we have two things at the bottom that aren't quite so favorable for tornado for a for tornado for for prob tour. But everything else is gung ho. So here's some questions you can ponder. Um, how much time do we have? You got 25 minutes, so we can talk about this, or maybe you just think about this. Um, and I like the last two questions the most. What part of the storm life cycle do satellite predictors seem to help the most? So since this is the satellite meteorology, oceanography, and climatology um, short course, when do you think satellite predictors seem to help the most? 
And the other one is list two or three differences you notice in predictor importances among the different storm type examples. So I'm not going to ask you to answer that out loud. I'll just ask you to ponder that for a bit. And then we will, then I'll say what I think might be right. I don't know. Um, I like to say I'm not the expert. Um, there are other questions that are like, what is the difference between link equals identity and link equals log IT, L-O-G IT? Well, how does one pronounce that, John? <laughs> I just, I usually just say logit. I don't really know. Okay. <laughs> but I think we've given you enough information that you know the answer to that one. Um, so what part of the storm life cycle do satellite predictors seem to help the most? And two of the satellite predictors are um, cloud top cool, well, um, normalized. I'm going to have to look. It's It used to be cloud top cooling. Now it's normalized growth rate, um, something like that. And there's also a So at the moment, I might be confusing Prop Severe version three and version two. So that that's a that's an issue of mine from from, that, from knowing too much information. Um, but I will say that during the initial development of the storm, if you don't have a lot of cirrus, that's when the satellite predictors are probably be helping the most. As the storm matures, and you just have a thick cirrus shield you're not going to have information about how strong is the updraft growing. So there could be updrafts underneath the cirrus shield that are growing very quickly, but the satellite's not going to be able to detect them. So before the interfering anvil develops is really when the satellite predictors are probably going to be helping you the most. Um, and I'll have John chime in if this answer is giving him heartburn. <laughs> I think what you said is, is right. <laughs> um, is glaciation still one of the predictors? That isn't. Is not. Okay. So in the, in past prob severes, how quickly the storm cloud was glaciating, which of course is no, how quickly the storm is glaciating was one of the predictors, but further development of this algorithm has kind of relegated that to something that's not as important as other predictors that have been used. So you could, you know, you could have an infinite number of predictors, but each one comes at a cost. So you evaluate which ones are most important, kind of like using this type of evaluation, predictor importance stuff. Um, and eventually you realize that you know, something like mid-level lapse rate is much more important a predictor than how fast is the cloud glaciating. Um, so what two or three differences you might have noticed in the predictor importances among the different storm type examples? Um, I hope you've pulled something out from, of, I hope you can formulate an answer to that as well. Um, what I have What I have observed is that each storm, there are some that, you know, when they're huge, you can expect something interesting to happen. So if, if CAPE goes way up and the shear is way up, typically your prob severe values will be very large. But for less obvious, for storms that are producing severe weather in a less obvious environment, um, I really like how prob severe is able to give you a value that, that takes the information from all the different predictors and tells you something about the likelihood of, of severe weather, even for systems that aren't quite so obviously likely to produce severe weather. Um, so you might have a case where you have very high mesh or very low mesh, but you're still gonna have a high probability of severe, severe weather um, if there's a low mesh, so low, 
observations of low values of um, low values of um, hail thickness or hail size, um, you can still have a combination of other predictors that say, well, you know, you might not be getting severe weather from the hail, but you might have very strong winds based on the observations there. So, so it's, we have 20 more minutes. I don't know if you have any, I don't know if there have been questions in this because I haven't been monitoring the quest, the Q&A. Um, yeah, I've been answering some questions. But there, I mean, th these Google collaboration things are out there for you to play around with. Um, so I encourage you to do that. And let me stop sharing as we coast coast down toward the end. Um, and I want to bring something back. Just to remind you all to do this. Oops, to do this. Nope, that that's what I want. So please take this short survey. I will it, <clears throat> and at the end of this. So you will be able to view this again. Uh, this will be uploaded to YouTube, a recording of this um, as quickly as possible. Um, the presentations are, are go going to be posted on the website that's at CIRA. So this has been showing up in the chat occasionally. Um, and there's a short survey that you, that you will receive after the training session, or you can click it now because it's been in the chat. And we're trying to help guide the development of future short courses. Um, so if you found this one really interesting and you want to see more on um, machine learning tools from experts like John, um, it might not necessarily be John next time. Um, note that and hope to see you at the fourth one on July 16th. And with that, um, are there questions we should be looking at? Let me stop sharing. Did I, did I share this? Yeah, you're not sharing anymore. Oops. Okay, oh, so <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me share this. Okay. Hope you can see this. This is what I should, well, this is what I was talking about. So there's this link that is in the that has been in the chat so please take this survey like i said the survey is short but the link is long um and the last slide here um enjoy this course and there's another course coming up in uh what is that 15 20 days in about three weeks hmm. um that you that we hope you'll attend as well and like i said if you want the survey helps this AMS SATMOC committee determine what's going to be presented as a short course. So some guidance from you, the students, is very, very useful. <laughs>